everyone. Thanks for joining us. Um, if you can tell us where you're from, I'm just going to type here. Where, where are you guys from? Okay, so we have people from Egypt. Where else? Let me see. Hola, are you from Spain? Uh, Philip, oh, hi, Philip. How are you? <laughs> we have from Morocco, Romania, Iraq, Turkey, Yemen. Cool, Belgium, India. London, Sweden, Spain, Jordan, very good, Tunisia. Hi guys, thank you for joining us in this uh, webinar with the title Hair Transplant Gone Wrong. So I'm just going to go uh, do a quick introduction to everybody um, just to tell you what eCamps is about and introduce you to the um, speaker. And as you can see, uh, I'm the CEO and founder of Ecamps Pin. And um, we have John today with us. He's the chairman of ISHRS. And he's he the first was. He was. Chairman. He was? Okay. The first chairman <laughs> and brother. He was. All right. Now. <laughs> and he's the first physician to become the diplomat of American Board of Hair Restoration Surgery and he dedicated himself. I think he's well known, uh, so I, I, I don't have to introduce, go into details about what he has established. And same for Christian Bizanga and I, I misspell your name, sorry, <laughs> with our A. Uh, Christian is our head of restorations, um, surgery and science in ECAMS and he has more than 20 years of hair transplant experience. He's the founder of BHR Clinics. And we have Asim, uh, the president of Trigot was or is? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, his regular contributor on ongoing research in the University of Manchester and he performed his first eyelash transplant in 2009 and he's widely, widely known for his charitable work in Pakistan providing free hair and eyebrow to um, transplant to the exit attacks victims so uh, thank you so much um, for joining us for able to come to, to um, contribute to this uh, talk. Now, um, eCamps, we have, um, to date, we have trained um, more than 1,200 international doctors worldwide and in 11 international training facilities. Majority of our doctors are UK and Europe. And of course, the next um, segment we have is actually America, followed by Asia and then the Middle East. So our the specialty you can see is also widely spread out. Um, as you can see over here, that uh, we have mostly plastic surgeon, aesthetics, doctors, and also dermatologists here. And we have gynecologists too on the big segment of them. So one of the unique selling point of uh, eCamps is that we have actually progressive learning. So we actually take the doctors down up from level one all the way up to the master level. And it encompasses dietetic theory, hands-on examination questions, uh, accredited all the CPT and CME points and ongoing mentorships that we have. So um, as you can see here, um, the, the progressive learning we don't just teach a course, but we allow in different levels for people to actually participate in the hands-on training. So uh, right now, because of the pandemic, we have moved our uh, didactic lecture theory into bite-sized online learning courses, which um, this three speaker, Christian, um, John, and also Asim is going to be um, doing their uh, contributing bite-sized virtual learning with us. So do sign up um, for their course. And we have hands-on on surgical, non-surgical, and also commercial. Commercial mm -hmm. meaning we help you to um, make your uh, clinics run more effectively. Mm -hmm. And we also provide clinical mentoring and clinical coaching, followed by a fellowship program. Now, um, this is the 
the progress of um, the fellowships if you are interested in our fellowship programs because we do have a fellowship in hair transplant which means you have to start off with a bite-sized online theory first followed by the online examination then you have to attend our hands-on training logbook will be recorded followed by clinical mentoring slash coaching and a written examination before you achieve your fellowship now this is a long progress um it is tough it is difficult um but it is worth it all right um our new website is up so go to our website ecamedicine.com and um, you'll be able to find all our bite-sized courses over there now this is the progress how what we need you to uh, fulfill in order to get your fellowship in hair transplantations and science and followed by we have also a, a fellowship in aesthetic medicine, in facial surgery, in body contouring, and also in genital rejuvenation. So this is our um, um, social media. So do follow us on Instagrams and uh, e uh, and Facebook. Now, if you have any question, please type your message on the chat. Um, we will we're gonna have John to give us will be the first speaker followed by Christian the second speaker and then Asim then we'll take all the questions uh, after that so um, please write down your questions on the chat and then we will uh, as you go along so that then we can actually address them at the end of the session so with that I'm going to um, pass the first talk to John so John I'm gonna start your presentation there you go, John. Okay. So I'm going to talk about the gone wrong part of hair transplantation before the other guys start to talk about how to do it properly. Cool. So today we, we have poor candidates for hair restoration surgery and they're the same individuals that have been in this field for 60 years. They're patients with excessive hair loss, poor donor area, uh, high expectations, and the quality of their hair may not be suitable for hair restoration surgery. So this is your typical patient who might present in his 20s. He's not a good candidate. If you start surgery on this individual who has fine hair, even though his donor area looks like it's full, you're going to have a see-through result. So success in hair restoration surgery is based on the patient as much as it is the quality of the work you provide so you have a, a patient like this if you start a low hairline on him you've just added several square centimeters of surface area and you're going to fail so you always want to look at the surface area you want to make sure that you understand that a norwood five will have approximately 150 to 180 square centimeters of hair loss you have much less donor area so we're very fortunate however that most patients don't progress to a norwood seven which is hippocratic type hair loss until age 70 typically is when you start to see high numbers only three percent by age 59. So how much hair can we move? Well, it depends on the quality of the donor area. If patients have a lower density or they have fine hair, you may move only 2,500 grafts and you're done. But outstanding candidates, you might move 10,000 grafts. And if you move outside the traditional safe donor area, you may get 13 to 14,000 mm -hmm. grafts. So this is your uh, traditional safe donor area. Uh, it has 15,129 follicular units on average. And that's in roughly 203 square centimeters of donor area. There are patients with high density and there are patients with lower density. And patients with higher densities, you can move more hair. They're better candidates. Be aware that patients can lose hair in the lower part of their occipital area. Uh, we can see that this uh, area we would call the uh, coronet. And that's an indication he's going to a Norwood 7, I mean a Norwood 6. So he's not the optimal candidate for hair restoration surgery uh, due to that alone. And I got that slide courtesy of Pradeep Sethi. Uh, that's about 40% of this uh, safer donor area. So it really cuts down on that 203 square centimeters of donor area. 
Now, as you go through the donor area, you may encompass telogen hair and miniaturized hair, and that means that donor area is less safe. You're more likely to lose it. And over time, patients will uh, lose hair in their donor area. And that means when you move hair to the top, it's going to thin out over time. There's a big drop by age 60. In fact, by age 70, patients have approximately 14% less hair in their donor area than they had when they started. So they progressively become worse candidates. Patients with a higher diameter will have um, be a better candidate than patients with fine hair. So you have to look at the quality of the hair. Patients with thin or density uh, will not be a suitable candidate. And even with one pass, this patient is quite thin in his donor area. Uh, so be aware of that. If you've got fine hair and low density, you're going to run into trouble. And the whole point here with ECAM is to teach you to be a better surgeon so that you minimize scarring and you get high quality results by choosing the proper graft size. And Chris is going to go over hairline design. So we want something that's natural in appearance, not man-made. Well, this candidate here was a bad can suitable candidate for hair restoration surgery. And these same candidates exist today. And this was a very bad idea to do a hair transplant on this patient. He's got way too much hair loss. He's going to a Norwood 7. And over time, uh, he can't keep up with it. So the only solution is to remove these grafts. And we do it by extracting them just like we do regular FUE. And we can turn him into a normal bald guy. Another situation, this guy's going to a Norwood 7 over time, but he wants more hair. His donor area is basically depleted. It means we don't have much we can move. So the only option is to move into the beard to rescue this guy. Another bad when he was young, he had his uh, grafts placed. He doesn't want to finish the hair transplant. He just wants to be a normal bald guy. So we got to take him out. Now we want to try to rescue you from mistakes like this. You know, the, believe it or not, today, results like this are still occurring. We have patients with low, pluggy hairlines, with pitted grafts, and you can't rescue them with tattoos. Over-harvesting the donor area in an in a unpredictable manner like this can result in something that's worse than um, doing nothing at all. And we certainly don't want to leave patients with scars on their chin or in their donor area if we can help it. Low, pluggy hairlines like this that are too broad will need to be taken out and re redone properly. So you have to learn the proper technique and the proper location for the hairline and the proper size graft. And that's what Chris is going to get into. This is a patient who had m multiple shaven patches done with FUE. It leaves him looking like a zebra. And it required about four procedures to get his donor area normal. And this was done by a seasoned hair transplant surgeon who I told eight years before he did it not to do it. He did it, and I had to rescue the patient. Uh, if you have large grafts, you're going to get ridging. That's just because of volumetric displacement. So too many hairs and too much tissue around the grafts is going to create ridging. We want to create things that are natural, not man-made. And scars like this appear man-made, and we have to teach you how to avoid things like this. But if you get them, you need to know how to repair them. It took me about four sessions with this patient to get his donor area where it didn't look like he'd had a strip surgery. He was a bad candidate, should have never had a hair transplant, and now he just wants to be a normal bald guy. If you place grafts too low, they're going to have to come out. And that's just extra work for that patient. And it's extra money. It's really going to be a problem for him. If you build hairlines that are too low and pluggy and unnatural like this, they're going to have to come out. You can't place the frontal temple junction lower than the midfrontal point. And you can't create temple points that are greater than 90 degrees in angle. So you've got to move that back. So again, Hairline's too low, midfrontal point is uh, higher than the, the frontal temple junction, and the angle is greater than 90 degrees. It's all wrong. 
very pluggy grafts on this hairline. These have got to be removed. Um, you know, if you do strips like this, you're, you're going to wind up with a alteration in hair growth angles. You want to create donor areas that look like this. And there's new technology on the market that cuts down on the surface area of skin that's excised. And we can go in and extract these flicker units intact and not get these large vertically shaped ellipses that we get with traditional round punches. We get something more like this where the flicker unit's intact, but there's less tissue that is excised from the donor area. So the objective is not to create these round or vertically elliptical wounds, but rather a horizontal ellipse and something like this that will heal much quicker. Now, I'm gonna talk a little bit about regenerative medicine because hair restoration surgery is much different than any other form of aesthetic surgery or plastic surgery. We start working on patients when they're young because their hair loss is nothing more than accelerated aging. And we try to turn them around and make them look younger at a young age. We don't do facelifts on patients in their 20s and 30s unless it's Michael Jackson. So regenerative medicine is what's going to help keep that hair around. And I've, I've been doing hair restoration for 30 years now. And so I see patients 20 or more years after their first transplant where they used to look great, but they didn't stay on top of it. They lost hair and now their solution is not as simple. So we get into a patient like this who has excessive hair loss. He's not a suitable candidate for a hair transplant. So we start him on regenerative medicine and he starts to restore his hair and he gets, just keeps getting better and better. And so now he's a suitable candidate for some sort of hair restoration surgery if we want to. And you can kind of see that he had better quality hair to begin with in the perimeter, like over in here. Um, so if, if you start out with better hair, like in this area, you're going to get a better result in this area. And so why is that important? It's important because, um, thumbnail move here. I can't get to the clear button. <laughs> okay. It, it's important to start as early as possible in hair restoration surgery and to initiate regenerative medicine. Because when you capture hair before it's fallen out, you have a better probability of success in regenerative medicine. And what are we talking about with regenerative medicine? Topical finasteride, amniotic membrane, exosomes, PRP, lysed platelets, adipose-derived stem cells. You can even throw in micropigmentation and hair restoration surgery into this patient. Don't wait till the patient has lost hair before you initiate regenerative medicine. And the reason is very simple. You're not going to grow grass on concrete. You need to capture these patients while they still have hair. This guy was very lucky to get what he got. And I see that we didn't get my last slide in. You, you uploaded a talk that I did a little bit quicker, but that's about all I have. Right, perfect. So um, this is your actually your last slides, uh, John. Yeah, so, I know. I, I'd uploaded a different version and I had taken out some of these slides. But uh, uh, <laughs> and I in, and put another one in, but it didn't make didn't make the cut. Okay. Uh, okay. No, no problem. So um, we have. Uh, I think there's a few questions. Uh, we're going to address that later on. So I'm going to move on to. Um, thank you so much, John, for the information. So I'm going to move on <laughs> to uh, Christian. So there you go, Christian. Hello, everyone. <clears throat> so. <laughs> uh, in the hair transplantation gone wrong, I'm just going to quickly uh, approach the hairline design because most of uh, our patients uh, that we see who had uh, poor hair transplant, mainly uh, a poor hairline design. So why is it important uh, for hairline design to be done properly? Uh, because most of our patients today want to have a natural hair line. A natural hairline is possible, but you need to know what are the rules to make sure that you have a good hairline design. 
Uh, patient will walk into your office and say, I want a, a Brad Pitt hairline. And, but if you don't have Brad Pitt head shape, the hairline is not going to look good. So there is an artistry part. Uh, there is a, a medical part, the medical theory about the hairline and hairline design. But I like to say that hairline is a whole. Uh, it's a larger zone. It's not just the first two, three rows, but it's how the hair goes from the front to the mid part of the scalp, you know, to the transition zone. And today with FUE, we, we can cherry pick the type of uh, follicles that we need to make sure that the hairline is softer. So it is important even when you do FUE to have microscope. The usage of microscope is very important in order for you to select the correct type of uh, a graph for the hairline, the correct singles with no telogen hair in it, because then it may lead to it two, three hairs and it may look unnatural. And then bone structures will really dictate the shape and the type of uh, hairline that uh, is suitable for someone. So hairline design rules, you have to look at bone <coughs> structures. You need to learn the landmark. Uh, the scalp zone, the proportion, you know, a lot of people throw the Da Vinci rule, but Da Vinci, when he did it, it was mainly to do it uh, uh, to, to draw someone, but uh, it's more complex than just motion part. The hairline has to look natural, uh, not a man-made uh, design, and there is no shape fit all. It's important to understand ethnic uh, variation and also to look at female design because a lot of female will come also uh, for hairline design or the transgender patient. So it's important to understand all uh, the rules in terms of uh, uh, particularity uh, about hairline design so you can uh, propose what is uh, suitable for the patient. So face shape, uh, I'll go quickly. Face shape is more a concept of, uh, I'll say hairdresser than uh, hair transplant doctors. So it's important that uh, you need to measure or you need to look at the, the face uh, shape. And for you to do that, you have to look at the uh, frontal bone, I'll say frontal boss, um, your cheekbone, the jawline, and uh, the face length. Um, so you have people who round or I'll say hard shape or pear uh, type of uh, face. On this patient, uh, you can see that um, because he has a round face, you can easily uh, give him um, this type of hairline that you curve a little bit, because when you establish that midpoint, uh, it's important to know if you're gonna go upward, you're gonna go flatter, or you're gonna go downward. So um, face shape will dictate the kind of uh, design that you need to know. So if you have a square type of face, um, it's also important to know that those are the ones that may benefit, they may benefit from a flatter design. You know, you have patients coming and asking uh, for a flatter design. So it's important to understand all this face variation to make sure that you do a proper design. People with uh, rectangular uh, shape, uh, face. They have also another different type of uh, hairline that you can design. If you give them the natural bell curve uh, design, it may not look natural on this patient. So it's important to understand the face uh, uh, shape as well. People with diamond type of uh, uh, design, also important to grasp all these concepts. Triangular design. Uh, those who have a flatter hairline, a triangular type of shape hairline, but it's really important to understand. So 
when you take the classes, we really go into details how uh, to understand and how to design uh, the hairline on this type of uh, uh, patient. Oval type, hard type, and sometimes you may find even a combination of both type, uh, like a rectangular and a little bit oval. So you can mix and understand the typical how you going to design. There are a few rules and few landmarks that uh, uh, need to be known. This is a courtesy of Sam Lam and uh, uh, Ron Shapiro. They have extensively uh, put out what you need to know, but it's important to understand that the, uh, the central anterior point uh, that is here, it's important to understand that this could be most of the time the lower point. So if you close the recession without taking account of this, you may look completely natural. So it's important to understand that. It's important to understand where you put your temple point. They are landmark, they are textbook that talk about it, but it's important uh, to know that you just don't design a hairline uh, without uh, uh, understanding the rules. And then the scalp zone, hair flow there is a logical way of uh, flowing the hair flow uh, and then also you have the angulation that is important if you a lot of uh, bad hair transplant that we see you have not only the problem but also the problem of angulation and the direction so it's important to understand uh, what is actually the best angle when you make the incision um otherwise you're gonna end up with uh with people looking like tintin uh i know here in bedroom we are, uh, we are the land of tintin but you don't see tintin in the street uh, often so it's important to understand that when you plant uh hair on a hairline you have to keep maybe a 20 uh 25 degrees angulation because most of the hair transplant will take up 10 15 degrees when they grow so then you can reach the normal so if you put your 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 design and you start making sight almost a uh, 45 degrees then then when the hair will grow uh you may end up with uh, 70 uh, degrees uh hair on a hairline and it's not going to look natural so it's important to understand the flow of hair take time to observe people when you are in an airplane where you, you are sitting in a, in the a train and just to see people coming and just understand the flow of uh, the hair and uh, it's important that will give you an idea so also the proportion rule um it's important to understand that uh we talk a lot about proportion but not every patient has the third rule. So uh, it's important to, to see the age of the patient here. See, Brad Pitt has very strong hairline. They have very strong temple point. Uh, so yes, he can have that low hairline that most people cannot. So when people come, because I don't know you guys, but me, most of the uh, patients come with uh, Brad Pitt uh, hairline pictures and uh, they want Brad Pitt, you know, when you used to be with Angelina Jolie, I would say, okay, if you bring Angelina Jolie, I'll give you a Brad Pitt hairline. But uh, that was just a, a joke. Uh, you can all have this type of hairline. Um, if, if you know six, know five, it's just uh, unbelievable um, how many patients will come with a node five, node six design and uh, want this type of low crazy hairline so you have to be able to say no so what we call natural if you look at this patient this is some of the example of my work um patient with oval shape you can give them the traditional bell curve uh design higher hairline and it looks natural uh it doesn't have to be a lower hairline for it to look natural so uh you choose the finest hair to put on the very front. You use microscope and you close the temple 
really um, making sure that the, the central midpoint is the lowest part. And also to be careful in designing sample point. I personally don't like doing a lot of sample point because most of the time you don't find that small, finest hair. And especially if patients with very coarse hair, if you put sample point, if you build sample point, it's just going to look bushy. It will look like you have pubic hair uh, coming out of the temple. So it's important. Uh, yes, patients ask for sample point but you need to look at the quality of hair, uh, what type of hair patient has. And sometimes you have to refrain for rebuilding those temple points because they're not going to look natural. Mm -hmm. This is a patient of mine who sent the pictures and I asked him to draw uh, his desired hairline. What he come up with, he gave me this design. Most patients have no clue. They just want to close the temple. For them, the problem is the temple, but you have to come and give them and tell them you can't have that crazy arch uh, design, this more female type. Um, you need to have some sort of recession. And you see here on the lower part, a patient who had exactly what I say not to do. Uh, it was designed and all this was completely wrong. The density is wrong. The direction is wrong. So we had to remove that. Uh, Sometimes a good design will require you to just keep it a little bit like that. So it's important to understand all this and, um, and make sure that you cannot have a a broadly designed hairline, a very low hairline in a patient who are in the mid twenties, uh, it, it's going to have a problem down the line. Most of the patients, especially the 25 patients, they just have an aversion of uh, tempo. They want to have a lower hairline because they coming out of the teen. The only body image they have of themselves is the hairline they used to have in the 18, 20. So they think that 40 is way too old. Most of them would say, oh, by 40, I won't care a lot about my hairline. But it's not true. If your hair, if your hair loss is bothering you at 20, it probably mm -hmm. going to continue bothering you at 40 or 50. So it's important for doctor to understand where to draw the limit when it comes to rebuild the hairline. So. For you to avoid this type of mistake, you need to understand and you need to be trained properly. Unfortunately, you go to a lot of meetings, it's just theory, but you don't have hands-on. And here would provide hands-on to make sure that people will get the training that they need. Then ethnicity variation, okay? Um, if you look at people of Afro-descent, the hairline is more straighter. Yes, I know people will say uh, Jamie Foxx probably had a hair transplant, so that's why it's a little bit too low. But Morgan Freeman, from my knowledge, didn't have a hair transplant. They had a very flat type of uh, hairline. Um, here, uh, Lenny Kravitz have more a type of uh, inverted U type of hairline. So you can have all kind of hairline but you have also to look at the shape of the face because the shape of the face dictated also here the type of hairline that you need asian uh variation you have more a broad broad type of hairline and my friend kim young lu uh, have more a over type and so this type of uh, hairline shape will fit him better but it's important to understand that so you cannot have a same size fit or uh, type of design hairline shape match also face shape so it's important to understand that uh, you can just design a hairline without taking into account all this Female design, 
female design, what I like is really um, you have to understand that sometimes the hair in a female flow, there is like a flow here where all the hair originate. So there is the kind of logic that it's important to grasp. Most female will have that. And if you look here, you have more an opening. So when you reveal that, you have that M shape, but it's not, it's never a full hairline. When you look here, Rihanna, she has those baby hair. So when you rebuild the hairline, you have to make sure that you just don't give a very strong brick wall of hair is not going to look natural. Uh, so just keep in mind all this variation. Um, this is the type of again the result. You can give a good result on a patient of mid age um, by keeping a higher hairline. Um, you have a higher hairline and uh, you look fuller, you put them on medication, you, you make sure that they stay on medication because they're probably going to continue losing their hair. So if you don't pay attention, uh, all this will, will continue thinning. But if you put them on medication, you can see that uh, a year later, uh, the hair there is strengthened. So you have a patient that is happy and uh, uh, you can move on and you can move on and delay as much as possible second procedure. Same with uh, this is a patient of a certain age. Uh, put a good uh, high hair design, make sure to put on medication for him to have this type of result. Afro hair, uh, female, because of traction alopecia, they come to have something to be restored. So it's possible with FEE to restore. Again, we keep that shape because she has the, the face, facial structure that match uh, the, the type of uh, uh, face to get that type of rounded <laughs> design for it to look natural. Um, again, you find a lot of uh, female patients who do not like their hairline uh, because they feel like it's a little bit uh, higher. So important again to make sure that the shape uh, is look natural. We rebuild the hairline and you can see we didn't make it very dense here because she never had that to start with. Uh, so this is what really a design, a hairline design needs to look like. So what you can take home as a message today is when you creating a hairline, you have to consider a lot of factors and ethnic sensitivity is one of them. Uh, hairline is designed different from gender, facial shape, age, and uh, type of hair that you're gonna place. Uh, it's important to understand that before and, and uh, so, you may, I say it's very easy to mess someone up uh, with a badly designed hairline, but the correction or the repair of a badly designed hairline may take two, three surgeries sometimes. And it can take a financial toll on a patient and as an emotional toll. So it's important that male, female hair, the fair in position, you have to understand uh, when to go upward, when to go downward, when to stay flatter. So this is it for me on this message. I'll, I'll pass to Asim. Thank you so much, um, Christian. So now I'm going to um, stop your slides and I'm going to turn on Asim's slides. So uh, Dr. Asim is actually going to go through eyelash transplant um, slides, pros and cons. So there you go, Asim. Thank you. Hi, guys, um, all around the world. Right. What's the reason of uh, eyelashes? Well, first of all, everybody would like to have as long eyelashes as they can. Even this many wants the fiat wants to have their beautiful lashes. <laughs> but what's the purpose of um, 
eyelash transplant, you know, and uh, what does the rather eyelashes do? I mean, first of all, the, the, the function of lashes is ornamental, <clears throat> but they also have a protective function. Any kind of wind or dust we have to blink, and then hence they have they, they protect. And when we, uh, we when we blink, this secretion releases on the cornea. That's another form of protection. But eyelashes and eyebrow, they do bring the face. And um, uh, if somebody has no lashes or no brow, it looks a bit odd. And people will say, well, there's something is not right with this particular patient's or particular person's face. So it removes a salient anatomical feature. And uh, every individual has different kind of eyebrow style and eyebrow design and hence eyelashes. Some people, uh, the, the oriental uh, um, people have very, very short lashes and but they're, they're still very good with that. Right. Right, what are the options? If someone wants or somebody doesn't have the lashes, what shall they do? Well, first option, just live with it, do nothing. But of course, that's not the reason for most of the people and they, they would like to look better, younger, good looking. So that's how about seven or eight females end up wearing false eyelashes. And, but there's also a product available known as prostaglandin analog which is uh, different in different countries. In the UK, it's known as Revitalash. And um, in America, it's available as Latisse. Um, well, what do they do? They, well, they can, those who have short lashes, they can apply the, this product at the base of the lashes. And then they start to growing a bit longer. But at some point, they will stop. But then you, you have to use that for the rest of your life. And people see results. In, in about four weeks, four four months, which is 16, 16 weeks time, but not very many people can grow new lashes. Those who are completely gone, they are gone, and it's just like with, with the hair transplant. If they are completely gone, you can't grow with anything else. You, if, if there's not a single hair available in the on the scalp, if we take finasteride, nothing is going to grow. Right, this is one of the most common uh, pictures I see from patients that they bring different photographs from high high profile people and, and girls and celebrities and actresses and they want to look beautiful they want lush lashes and well this is how they they used to to have lush lashes with this false eyelashes but if they want to have eyelashes what are the indications uh, where we should be thinking in terms of doing an eyelash transplant so the etiology, the most common, one of the most common causes of eyelash loss is uh, trichotillomania, which is an obsessive compulsive disorder. Um, some people, some girls pull their hair, some, some girls pull their eyebrows, some, some pull their lashes. And until and unless OCD is stopped for at least 12 months to 18 months, one should not operate on them. And if we are 110 percent sure this this particular person is not having uh, current trichotillomania, then perhaps you can you can uh, go ahead with it. But how would you know that uh, she is not pulling her lashes anymore? So what I normally do, I ask the patient's relative to come along, and uh, who they really live with them. Doesn't matter as their partner or kids or any relative who, who are with them, and ask them whether is, is she really or he still pulling the eyelashes out. So should not do uh, active, uh, so should not do any surgery on active trichotillomania. Then facial trauma, facial trauma due to burns, it doesn't matter if thermal burns or chemical burns, uh, any kind of a scars, maybe due to some illnesses or any kind of surgery um, on the face, uh, any road traffic accidents or any any industrial accident uh, that has left a scar on the upper lid, uh, you can perform uh, eyelash transplant. Radio radiotherapy can cause uh, a loss of lashes, but most of the reasons uh, my patients come to me 
uh, are for cosmetic reasons, um, which is they all want lash lashes and they want to look as long as they can. Um, but again, uh, it has to be varied to individual patient, whether you offer them the prostaglandin analogs first, uh, which I normally do, and ask them to come back to me after six months, because it takes about good four months uh, to do those lashes to grow back, or rather a bit longer. And then they're still not happy that, of course, you can, you can perform uh, for cosmetic reasons as well. Some kind of alopecia. Um, but you need to be aware that if there's alopecia areata, in, even in the eyelid, then it may not grow. So if you patients want to take the chance, you better inform them. Uh, long term of false lashes. This is my second biggest um, uh, in my practice that patients who come in, they have been using false lashes for long term. When I mean long term, anything between between three years to ten years. And uh, I'll show you another slide in a moment. Um, when they want to pull out, either on the weekly or monthly basis, they pull out their natural lashes as well. Hence, over time, they lose their own lashes. And, um, and that's the, the indication that you can, you can perform uh, our lash transplant on these. Those who have never grown any lashes by both congenital atresia, um, then atresia, then you, you can perform uh, our lash transplant. Recently, I've seen a couple of patients on who had eyelid tattoo, which has led to, to scarring and loss of their lashes. And some tumors can cause, of course, loss of eyelashes. So what happens when we do eyelash transplant? Uh, is it safe? Of course it is safe. That's why we do it. And what are the complications? As with any kind of surgery, the common ones are common still. It's eyelid infection, bruising, and swelling. Uh, it can have ingrowing hair. Again, this is again one of the common procedures with the scalp uh, transplant, hair transplant as well. Ectropion. Ectropion is, is the pulling of the lower eyelid, but it only happens when you're performing, uh, someone is performing in the, in the lower eyelid. And lower eyelid ideally should not be performed, and I do not do lower eyelid transplants. Um, and entropion, just turning in of the upper eyelid, I've never seen in my practice, but it's one of the recognized complications. Um, graft displacement, it's quite common when you wake up falling morning, start rubbing your eyes, the grafts are in your hand, the grafts are lost. So that's one of the most common ones that they have lost their lashes following a transplant. If someone has not poorly, uh, properly placed, uh, then they may grow in different direction altogether. This is the most common complication or most common problem we see following uh, uh, false lashes. Glue here. This all is glue, and that is a killer for these lashes. When they want to remove, the glue gets stuck to the base. And they want to remove the glue, they hence remove the lashes. And this is one of the most common ones going in over the last good 10 years, that whenever they have excessive use of false lashes, of course, they, they can't get stuck with anything else apart from tiny amount of glue. But that tiny amount of glue is massive for the small area of eyelashes. So hence, they lose lashes and they end up having a tiny little gap or massive gaps and uh, they, they come back and want to have an eyelash transplant. Well, typically there are about nearly 100 to 200 lashes in each eye. They're set in, in two rows, uh, front and the back row. And if you perform, if they ha somebody hasn't got any lashes whatsoever, if someone performs between 50 to 80 lashes per eye, it can give them an aesthetically pleasing results and a good result. Then you can always go back as, as with, with, with the scalp hair transplant. You can go back and increase the density later on. Same again here. You can go back and, and fill up the gaps in between. Second time round, you may just need maybe 10, 15 lashes in between. I always either uh, use single hair or right in the middle, I use two half follicle, but those two half follicle have to be very, very tiny 
very small, otherwise they will leave a bump on the on the upper eyelid or the lower space. But performing eyelash, the upward curl, hair is curly. I know some hairs are wavy, some hairs are curly, some are straight, but even a straight hair, you, you put them on the on the table, if they are naturally straight, they may have tiny little curl at the bottom. And that curl, upward curl is very, very important to when you're performing the, the eyelash. Post op, well, I suggest my patients not to wash the uh, face for first couple of days. You have to wear the sunglasses even when they are asleep, to be honest, because when they are twisting and turning by mistake, they have rubbed their eyes. Transplanted has all gone. Uh, they can start wearing mascara and makeup about a week later, and uh, but that's the that's the key. The last point with regular bi-weekly trimming and perming, you have to inform your patients they are coming from the back of the of the uh, of the head, and as the scalp has grown long, they will grow long, and you have to teach them. I give them normally a perma and a, and a curler and a scissor and I tell them either they can do it themselves or they can do go to a local salon and they'll be able to do it. But they have to trim on the regular basis. It's up to them how long they want to leave it, but they have to trim them and, and curl them. Otherwise, they will really grow straight because scalp hair are normally straight. But when you are facing the upward, upward curl, there will be a slight curl available still. Uh, uh, after transplant. Some of the cases, this uh, young girl who's 23, she's my one of the first cases about nearly 10, 12 years ago. Um, uh, she had OCD, so she used to pull out and I refused to operate on her until unless uh, she came on her own and until unless she's accompanied by somebody who are really who, who knows her in and out. So mother came in after one week with her and said, you can, I can guarantee that and I can give you in writing, she has stopped uh, uh, pulling her lashes anymore. They aren't, they aren't left anyway. And, but she, she, she was 22 when she came to me and she stopped pulling but while she was 16. So I went on and did surgery on her. Um, no lashes whatsoever. Another girl who I'm going to show the result of that later on. Um, another girl who had uh, no upper lashes due to, there you go. And there's a tiny scar here as well, right in the middle. And there's a solitary bump in that middle part, which I marked before. And this is secondary to, to chicken pox. And you can even see on the on the left eye, which is on your right hand side of the computer, um, that there's a tiny little bump there. And again, this is second to the chicken pot and the raptor scar. Now you can perform. I do uh, do a scar. Um, uh, do do eyelash on a patient with acid burn victims, um, but the guarantee of success. There's no guarantee of success whatsoever. But the success rate really is about 50-50 in these. So you have to inform the patient that, well, we can do it, but the chances are 50-50 because the scar tissue behaves differently. We do not know how it's going to behave. And ultimately, the follicle has come through that, through that scar, which is quite fibrous. I use local anesthetic with um, a dental syringe and dental needle, which is very, very fine. It's 32G uh, gauge, which is very tiny. And with one needle, uh, and, uh, you can uh, go in the lateral aspect and you can numb the whole lid. I use a French eye needle and uh, it has got a tiny hole here. And then it's just like threading into a uh, threading a thread into a into a needle and you insert individually one by one. Um, this is on the table. Uh, as mentioned early in my slide that uh, this bruising and swelling. So you can see it's <clears throat> right on the table and uh, there's plenty of bruising and swelling and I've left the lashes slightly long so that the patient can see. But when she opens her eyes, they will be around this area and it will still be using the function. But this lady has got a partial lid loss. Ideally, you should avoid 
going into a partially lid loss area because if you perform surgery, these are going to go in and that becomes entropion and, and it can cause conjunctiva. Uh, this is another girl who was the very first one which I showed before that's on the table. So there's an element of scabbing and element of swelling there on the table and bruising, so they should be aware, they should be wearing their sunglasses and, uh, and refrain from work for at least a week. They can hide with a, through, a, through the makeup after one week. And this is after five days. And uh, you can see this lash has grown quite long here now, not, not that long, but that is. So they've started to grow already, but as with the scalp, they will shed first and then they start growing through from six months onwards. And so one of the results. So there's a big difference. She had no lashes whatsoever on the left hand slide. On the right hand, she's got lashes. Now she's able to use a makeup bag. Another girl who had uh, no lashes whatsoever. Here you can see there aren't any lashes whatsoever here. And uh, once she, she closes her eyes on the right hand and the bottom slide, uh, got beautiful full lashes there. And now she can do whatever. Uh, also, those who want to use false eyelashes again, I suggest them not to use them again. Otherwise, they will even pull out the transplanted lashes again. Another result, you can see some here on the right-hand side slide that he, she had her own, this is for cosmetic reasons. She had her own lashes and there are lashes in between, which are finer, but she has not trimmed them. And she wants those lashes to, to remain a bit longer than the her own ones, so that it gives an illusion that she's got long lashes. That's the key, upward curl and trimming. If you don't trim, they end up like this. Thank you. So uh, it's it, but it's also difficult to perform. And, but the key is the realistic expectations of the patient. And you, they, they have to be trained and, and taught and informed about the long-term maintenance, but you get very high successful results. Thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed. Okay. Thank you, Asim. That's really good. I believe, you know, for the effort of trimming, long-term trimming, I think most of the girls would love to do that. And um, of course, when I was actually uh, researching for this topic, um, I found that there is 10,000 search per month. Um, so women are actually wanted to have less. <laughs> so, so it is actually a, a very good uh, procedure. Um, now i'm going to go through the um questions uh, i i know that john and um christian has been busy answering most of the questions so now let me go through with them so that everybody can listen uh can know what are the questions now the first questions that i have here is how many sessions of prp you recommend as for the result in previous patients i'm not sure which previous patient he's referring to but i think this is for john well, as I tried to show, not only does the patient lose the hair he presents with originally over time, the graft's thin as well. And so when we see patients come back uh, 20 years after a great result, the result is thinner. So I think that it's important to try as, as hard as possible to preserve the hair the patient presented with initially, but also to preserve the grafts. So it's an ongoing maintenance process. Now I can tell you from doing studies on cultured dermal papilla, uh, if I take a biopsy from one patient and culture their dermal papilla, uh, these, this patient may respond better to lysed platelets, uh, but he, another patient might respond better to amniotic membrane and another patient to uh, cultured adipose stem cells or stromal cells. So 
you know, the, the future of regenerative medicine is determining who is going to respond best to which product. Um, it's, uh, you know, the whole concept of uh, ge- genetic engineering is, is coming into play. And it's some of the work we've, we've been focused on in Turkey is isolating um, the, the best candidate for a particular product and how to make that product uh, work better in an isolated subset of patients. Uh, but for now, uh, I think a shotgun approach of just about everything is useful because we don't know what is a patient is, is necessarily going to respond to best. Um, and so I, I like PRP, amniotic membrane, exosomes, and stromal vascular fraction. All right. So um, there's a question here. I think, John, you have already answered him, but just for the sake of everybody, I, um, there's a young, um, it's by Patrick, it's a young patient plus fine hair, NW5, social pressure, quit school, stop to go outside. You send him to a psychiatrist. He advised you to do surgery. Do you proceed? What do you propose him? Less is more technique, SMP, or let him finish one day in the hand of wrong guy? <coughs> Very interesting question. Well, John. I, 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 would, uh, I would try to push this patient out as long as possible because I, I've seen these guys that, that are – they're struggling in their mid twenties, but by the time they're, you know, in their mid thirties and married and, and, uh, have a family, they, they, they somehow become, uh, tolerant of their hair loss. So you, you want to try as best as possible to get them to that point. If you do surgery on this patient with fine hair and significant hair loss in his twenties, he's the candidate that's more likely to go to a six slash seven on the Norwood scale. And uh, you can create a very unhappy patient down the road because he has to live under uh, whatever result you create. So whatever you do, it needs to look natural. Uh, I would definitely, you know, as Karen Salico taught me that uh, uh, topical finasteride is far superior to oral finasteride. And I'd definitely start him on that. And I'd look at, at other protocols and see if you can grow some hair like, like I did in that patient, which was, completely regenerative medicine, uh, out to, uh, you know, 14 months. And, uh, he had a nice response to that. So, um, and, and that makes him a better candidate because you know that you're going to be able to keep hair around longer. You, you might consider surgery in that individual, which I did. Okay. All right. And, uh, also the next question is also for John. He said, uh, how many sittings are required to extract all the grafts, uh, extracted from a very low hairline? Ooh. Well, it depends on how densely they're, they're placed to begin with. Um, you know, if they're widely scattered, you can do it in one session, but if they're really packed in there, especially with plugs, as Chris mentioned, it can be three or four sessions, uh, typically about three. Uh, and then there's different types of graphs, you know, the flicker unit or the plug, you can punch these out using basically reverse FUE. Um, but if they have slit mini grafts, you're going to have to excise those and, and suture the wound. And it heals beautifully, by the way. And re- removing all that volume helps the ridging or the elevated uh, bump. It feels like a speed bump on the hairline. It, it, it helps re- remove that volume and the skin will sit down. Mm-hmm. Maybe Chris has a comment. Yeah. Um, typically, three sessions, I usually tell them, but especially if it's dense, um what i usually tell them i don't know how they're gonna heal and it's in the front hairline so it's important to to see first the healing part as well because yes we want to remove those grafts but if we're gonna end up creating more scarring in the front of hairline that they will have hard time uh conceal so usually i do the first pass if they scatter it's easy you can remove everything but usually i'll leave some intentionally so when i'll come on the second pass so i don't have to have a lot of adjacent wound when i remove just to make sure that if they heal better (laughs) then i can proceed okay 
Good. Uh, the next questions I think for all of you is that um want to ask how many times do you make PRP and mesotherapy after a hair transplantation? You know me, I do PRP uh, every two months if it's possible for the patient. And uh, I only tell them if you want to go the road of PRP, you have to be consistent. Because most patients think that they can just do one session of PRP and that's it. Uh, every two months, there is no rational, but I just think that every two months, every two or three months, uh, it's uh, convenient. I use a little bit uh, uh, now dutasteride in mesotherapy. And uh, so that I usually do every three months. Okay. Um, next question is, what drugs given before hair transplant and post hair transplant? It's going to depend on patients. Uh, some patients who tolerate the uh, finasteride, but as John said, finasteride gel is actually doing very well. And I'm using a lot of minoxidil tablet. I think that uh, a lot of patients tolerate it more and uh, it's easy to take one tablet than to apply minoxidil twice a day. So how often, you know, if a patient is younger, uh, uh, when they ask me how long should I take this medication, I say as long as you want your hair on your head. The day you say hair is not a problem for me, then I can stop medication and accept what's going to come after that. Okay. Um, another one is, uh, what is your indication for PRP, John? Well, they, they, they need to have hair. You know, you, 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 PRP doesn't grow hair on a bald scalp. Uh, you can get a 50% increase in density with good quality PRP, and there's good PRP and not so good PRP. So you need to zero in on, on PRP that's got a better growth factor profile. Uh, but you can see a 50% increase in density at six months. Uh, the problem is if the patient has very fine hair, uh, it's like looking at hair on an arm, uh, you know, across the room, you don't see it. So the sooner you start this, the better the result will be. Unfortunately, these are individuals who complain of thinning, but they don't really have grossly apparent hair loss. But you can you can catch these individuals and do a hair check on them with a cross-sectional trichometry, and I've had women go from a 64 uh, to a to a 96 uh, in an area, and yet they're still complaining they're thin. Well, if you're a 96, that's about as high as it gets. The average is 70. So, um, you know, you catch them early, and you have a better probability of success with PRP. Uh, it, it's great at prolonging the life of the hair. And that's essentially what you're trying to do. Every hair has a limited number of cycles. And when you reach the critical number, that hair has gone. And, and, and it, you want to keep it out of the resting phase because in the resting phase, there's inflammation that attacks stem cell populations. And if you lose one of those populations, it's like, it's like having a cell phone that uh, is, it has no battery anymore. And your friend can call you all day long, but you're not going to answer that phone and you're not going to meet for dinner. And if you lose a stem cell population, you can't wake that hair back up and make it grow. So you try to keep it in antigen and you try to treat uh, that follicle to keep it on the head as long as possible. But you're also trying to treat the grafts. And I, I don't know that it, if it's every two months or every six months or every eight months, but patients will see a result typically around eight months and they complain uh, that the result fades away after about a year. Um, I think that probably every six months is going to be the chosen route. Okay. Now, uh, Christian, there's a question asking, do you like a flare in the hairline at the FTA or rounded? Hi. It, it really depends on the uh, patient's shape, uh, uh, as I say. So you, some people will love uh, uh, a flat uh, type of uh, hairline, but uh, it may not look natural at all. So uh, the, the shape of uh, uh, the recession uh, and um, 
the shape of the hairline is really based on uh, also on uh, bone structures. So I don't like any type. I just look at the shape and uh, draw it based on the shape. And then we started, I usually ask patients first, draw your hairline. And usually they draw sometimes crazy hairline and then based on density, based on everything that uh, John talked about, uh, then you start tweaking that hairline by showing him that this hairline would not work with your type of uh, bone structure or the type of density you have. So the key is really to make sure that you assess that patient's suitability for hair transplant. Uh, so the design goes after you have checked the density, you have checked uh, the trichometry, you have checked uh, everything, and then you can have an appropriate design. Okay. Uh, another question, I think this is for Asim, uh, is do you, have you encountered any iris darkening when using Lattice? No, not really, actually. It's a, a quite safe product and you're not uh, um, inserting into the uh, eyes at all. And uh, you just make sure you are in the in the body, which is right in the middle and in the lateral aspect. Um, and you're not, I've never come across with that. <clears throat> okay. Uh, even the manufacturers have not uh, considered that as a, as a, as a competition. And also, if we are doing eyebrow transplant, to what time do you accept them to keep trimming the hair? Is it lifelong? It is indeed. But uh, what I have noticed over the years that about five, ten years down the line, they start, start slowing uh, to grow as long as they used to. And then the frequency of trimming increases instead of doing on the on the uh, bi-weekly basis uh, rather once fortnightly basis they can even do to once in, in, a, in a month and once in two months but it takes a good long term to to uh, slow down and it's interesting you know we we noticed that also in eyebrows uh, many years ago that the rate of growth decreases and and pets can go to a, a once a month trim as, as yeah opposed to what you mentioned it um, twice a week. Hmm. And what is the best donor for eyelash hair? It's still a scalp because, you know, to thread into the, uh, for, for, for eyelash transplant, you have to have long hair. And um, although the scalp hairs are finer in comparison to the eyebrows, but the eyebrow hairs are, are very short and uh, you simply cannot thread them into the into the lid and they will not grow longer eyelash uh, have to be slightly longer than the eyebrow yeah assume we i saw a really interesting procedure in china where they were using 23 gauge needles stick in place to put single hair grafts in the eyebrow and the the, the nice thing about using the the uh, um, needle uh, technique you use is you create sort of a, a curved track for that hair, uh, but you also have to get that hair in its proper uh, alignment. It's got it's, it, every hair has a belly and a back, and that means there's only one orientation for that graft that's right. It, there's th 359 degrees of wrong, uh, so you have to look at that curve. And but this technique was really, really good, really good. Yeah, Ali Abbasi from Iran, he does stick in place, and uh, but uh, that's that's a different technique altogether. Um, but I normally use the French eye, and French eye has a curve itself, so it, it creates slightly upward curl when it's been inserted. Yeah, doc, Dr. Kim from Korea was the first to describe that technique. It's a really, really nice technique. Cool. Uh, now there is another question um, from the about the drugs. I think this is for um, minoxidil and finasteride uh, in perfect scenario two to three months before surgery, and the entire life after surgery. I, I think that uh, you know if you have a patient that comes to you with hair loss, 
and you don't offer him some sort of uh, regenerative protocol to keep his hair in place as long as possible, uh, you're doing the patient a disservice. And so I would start immediately and, and hopefully he won't need a transplant. Mm -hmm. uh, because I'm seeing patient, people asking when to start medication. Let's say the first day you see the patient in a consultation, you should leave your consultation with a script of medication. You need to start medication right away. And, and PRP. And some yeah. patients, that's an idea too, but uh, some patients uh, have uh, side effects from medication, even with the topical, which is, is less. There's less of a hit on the DHT. There's less drug absorption. You know, you can you can take one diclofenac for uh, a joint problem, uh, in or put a patch on the joint that's bothering you, and you're going to get one one hundred the the drug concentration in your blood from from that patch. You'd have to put on a hundred patches to equal the concentration of one pill in your bloodstream. But still, some patients do get side effects from the topical, and I don't know what part of that is psychological because there is a placebo effect. Uh, but those individuals who can't tolerate medications. Uh, need to be moved as quickly as possible into other uh, biologics and uh, and treatments like pre-RP, exosome, stromal vascular fraction, amniotic membrane. Next question, what is the role of stem cells in hair transplant? Well, I don't really think they're stem cells. I think they're, they're there's really nothing really stemmy about them. Uh, they're they call them stem cells, but they're really stromal cells. And um, they help uh, increase the proliferation of, of the cells in the dermal papilla. Uh, they theoretically can help the proliferation of uh, stem cells in the hair follicle. Uh, they are full of growth factors and exosomes from these uh, stromal cells. And they, they upregulate the hair follicle. They also increase the adipose, uh, which seems to increase with antigen. So their role is to promote antigen and to preserve the hair as long as possible. Now, I think it also has a potential use in scarring alopecia. And I've, I've got a few patients with uh, lichen plantar pilaris where we've, we've injected them with uh, SVF and nanofat and microfat and, uh, and gotten outstanding results with the transplant, uh, uh, which is not uncommon. However, the, the transplants do thin over time. So it's going to be interesting to follow these patients over time where we go back in, let's say, every six to eight months and uh, re-inject these people with their, their own uh, adipose uh, stromal cells. And uh, hopefully we can keep these hairs in the growing phase and because these are, are wonderful immunomodulary uh, cells that reduce uh, the inflammatory pathways and so there, it's theoretically possible that we can uh, control scarring alopecia using uh, your body's own immunomodul immunomodulation. Okay. And um, there's another question. It said, there is so many factors to master hairline design. How long did it take you guys to get to the point where you felt comfortable? <laughs> How long? Christian, you want to start first? I respond to that. I say, listen, if you have a good mentor, me, I did my training with John and uh, watching him designing hairline every day, uh, I think you become comfortable if you have that mentoring uh, on a daily basis. Uh, so you understand the pitfall and uh, why is designing this and not that. So I would say six months to a year, you if you have a good mentoring, yes. Yeah, you know what? When I started, um, everybody was doing plugs, and and you know, I did my first transplant. I read a book, and and I went to the back of the book, and they had something about micrographs in there, and I said that sounds better to me than these plugs, and so I, I kind of started with that. But when I asked people how to design a hairline, uh, they couldn't even tell me the the angle to put the graft in that made sense. So I had to kind of rationalize and reason it. And it took me really about a year before I, I had a, an understanding um, of what to do. And the reason is you, you have to, you have to give it time to grow. And when it grows then you go, oops, that doesn't look so good. And uh, so you have to correct it. So the one thing I would say to anyone that's newer in the field, 
don't build your final hairline in your first year. Uh, build it a little higher because you have room in front of that to perfect it later. Uh, don't be too aggressive out of the box. Okay. All right. And um, how how long will you advise young doctors to do the fellowship to master such procedure? Um, this one, I probably, you know, our fellowship programs in ECAMS, we kind of take you progressively. So um, it depends on individual. So there is no kind of a, um, a timeline that we say that you must complete your fellowship in a certain time set. So we really let you, you know, because uh, sometimes the learning curve needs to be longer and some people needs to be, you know, wants to speed up the whole process. But I think um, the progress that we have, which is first the cadaver, then the hands-on on live models, and then you've got to do the clinical mentoring with uh, and or coach with uh, uh, three of them, either one of them. So you get to choose where you want to go, who you want to go with, and um, um, and how many days do you want to be with them. So all this is actually we really kind of a custom made tailored to individual uh, in order for you to finally master the skill. So um, I think um, what we are trying to do here, Christian, if you correct me if I'm wrong, is that we really want to make sure that you master the skill rather than you come, you do the course, and then you go off, you go, and um, I think ours is a kind of a lifelong uh, um, um, handheld. Well, it, you know, I think that if you, if you, you really want to learn it well, and, and learning many times is not just um, learning what to do, it's learning what not to do. And, and I think that if you could spend a year with somebody, one year, with somebody who does cases every day, uh, you're going to learn a lot. Now, that's not to say you can't go and watch a surgery and, and walk out and do it. But I've, I've had guys that will come in and watch what I do, and then they go open a shop down the street, and, and then I get to see their patients that they – started on and, and I realized that, that they, they need to come back <laughs> because they designed really poor hairlines and put the wrong size graft on the hairline and, and uh, now it's a corrective procedure. So uh, uh, in a short span of time, but you learn a lot in a year. Yeah. Uh, and Asim, do you have anything? I lost the connection somewhere over there, so I'm I'm kind of uh, not sure which status are we in, and I've lost some of the uh, chat uh, questions. Um, I think because we have also overrun by 22 sec uh, minutes already, so uh, we're going to end this uh, webinar. And of course, if you guys continue want to have any questions, um, do. Um, uh, sign up and ask us more about the, we, we're going to upload the uh, bite-sized courses very soon by these three experts. Um, we'll be doing it over the next few weeks and um, <coughs> eye on all these courses and then do come and join our hands-on courses too. Um, again, when it times permit for everyone to travel safely, we are targeting to open up our hands-on courses in October. So, um, but before the hands-on courses, you will have to do the bite-sized courses first, and that's the requirements, and you need to pass the exam, of course. So, uh, thank you, everyone, and um, Christian, and Asim, and yes. John, do you have anything to add on? <laughs> yep. No, I think uh, we have a lot of people attending, and uh, so a lot of questions, but uh, no. <laughs> uh, you cannot learn everything in one day, so... Uh, in one to, hour <laughs> oh, in one hour <laughs> so people need to take time for, for a good mentoring and yeah. learning properly exactly so we I'd have like to say happy mother's day to all the gals out there oh thank you <laughs> stay safe and well thank you yeah. everyone all right thank you thank yeah, you bye bye, bye. bye.